Coming up on Stu Does America. We all know critical race theory is a major problem at the national level, but how is it affecting real people in their hometowns? I'll talk with Nate Hodgman about how parents in one county are fighting back. And New York City is set to hold its mayoral primaries. I don't really know or care who's running, but I am a fan of anything that sends Bill de Blasio back to Nicaragua. And despite the left telling you that only white people can obtain an official government ID, I have this crazy, wacky idea that maybe minorities can do it too. Huh? Let's cut through the media spin and do voter identification. You may have heard recently in the news that the United States of America is a divided nation. <laughs> I know. I, it surprised me, too. I hadn't heard anything about it until very recently. We talk about divisive issues all the time. That's kind of what we do here. We take an issue that makes most people uncomfortable to talk about, and we just come out here and blurt it out over and over again. That's the philosophy of the show. What a good idea. But today, we're not going to do that. We're abandoning the entire philosophy of the show. What I'm about to talk about might be the single most popular policy in all of our political discourse. Yet it's treated by the media like it's racist, and hateful, and impossibly divisive. That's because the American people have come to a different decision than the media. And the media hates that. Just because they've come up with one idea and the American people have said, you know what, your idea on this one is dumb, we're going the other way. And that makes an entire controversy, apparently. I'm talking about voter ID. There's a new Monmouth poll out. Public supports both early voting and requiring photo ID to vote, is what it's called. And it asks this very specific question. Hmm. In general, do you support or oppose requiring voters to show a photo ID in order to vote? This, if you ask the media, is about the most single, the single most hateful thing you can possibly do when it comes to an election. Now, judging by what the media and uh, what the left says about places like Georgia and Texas and Florida and their voting laws, what do you expect the answer to be to that question? You probably expect uh, res expect Republicans to love voter ID, and you are right on that. Republicans in the poll supported voter ID 91 to 8. 91 to 8, that's pretty good. But what you might not expect, especially if you watch the media coverage on this type of thing, is that independents, people in the middle, they're not Republicans, they're not Democrats, they're out there just looking at the issues. Well, they seem to love voter ID as well. Independents support voter ID as well, 87 to 10. 87 to 10. Now look, sure, it's one thing for Republicans to think it's a good idea. It's another thing to think independents think it's a good idea. That's all great. But Democrats, I mean, what you definitely would not expect uh, is that voter ID is an overwhelmingly popular policy position among Democrats, right? Democrats support it. 62 to 34, 62 to 34. This is a plus 28 policy among Democrats. How on earth is this talked about like it's some big divisive issue? Just not. Overall, it's just stunning. 80% of Americans support voter ID at the polls. 80%, only 18% Oppose 80% overall support. I mean, I say it again, this is one of the most popular policies in the public discourse. And it goes across ideological lines as well. As you'd expect, conservatives support it overwhelmingly 93 to 7 among conservatives. But it's not just conservatives, also moderates support voter ID by a, uh, just a, a hair 82 to 16. <laughs> and yes, even liberals 
like voter ID. Liberals support it 56 to 39. Now that's lower than some of these other numbers, but that's a plus 17 issue among liberals. Think about the coverage of these laws constantly every single democrat gets up in front of the tv camera and tells you this is jim crow 2.0 every media member talks about how much the uh, republicans hate uh, minorities they hate uh, everybody except uh, evil white men and we're talking about liberals people not even just democrats liberals support this overwhelmingly how about gender lines well Males, of course, you'd expect those evil men and their maleness to support a policy like this. They supported 82 to 16. Now, you expect those evil men to like people to have to identify who they are before casting a vote. Even if you say it in a scary voice, it doesn't sound all that scary. Um, it does sound just like those evil men, doesn't it? But also, it sounds like those not so evil women. Females support this policy 78 to 19. Think about this. Republicans have a plus 59 issue among women voters. And so many of them are completely terrified to defend it. Why? This is a gift from the gods if you're in politics. The fact that the Democrats are trying to stake out the opposing position in a plus 59 issue is the type of thing you beg and hope to happen to you one time in your life as a politician. Yet, here we are. Overwhelming support for voter ID exists among every age group as well. You'd expect those evil boomers to like it, of course, and they do. Everyone 55 plus, 79 to 18, they support voter ID. But guess what? Also, the Gen Xers like it. Ages 35 to 54, they support it 82 to 15. How about voter ID among the millennials? Ooh, 18 to 34, guess what? 78 to 19. Again, I ask you, Republicans have all sorts of problems with younger voters. This we know. And yet here is an issue where they have a, they're on the right side for once on a plus 59 issue, 59 points positive among millennials. And they're still running around the country apologizing for it. It's incredible. Now let's look at education splits. Obviously, those people without a college degree can't possibly get themselves an ID. So you'd think they would hate voter ID, right? No. Actually, they support it 85 to 12. 85 to 12. What's amazing is it's the elite, the people who look down on those without a degree, while they still hold overwhelmingly supportive uh, views of voter ID, their support is 16 points lower than those without a degree, which is fascinating. Uh, 69 to 29, if you have a college degree, you support voter ID. Now, it's hard to complain about a plus 40, but it is interesting to see how the people who think their lessers can't get a driver's license are always the ones explaining why voter ID is a problem. At the same time, the people who would theoretically have trouble getting ID are completely fine with it because they're not idiots. I know this is shocking to people on the coasts. This shows when you break it down by income as well. If you make less than 50K a year, well, you support voter, voter ID, 81 to 17. Also, if you happen to be in the middle class, let's say you make between 50 and and $100,000 a year, guess what? You support voter ID, 82 to 17. And let's say you are, um, I don't know, you're up in the upper crust a little bit. Overwhelming support there? Yes. It's a little bit lower, but guess what? You still support voter ID, 100K plus, 76 to 21%. Over and over and over and over again, the same story is being told here. This is amazing. As you might expect, those who have already registered to vote overwhelmingly agree with voter ID laws. Yes, they've already registered to vote. They've already figured out the system. They support it 80 to 18. But if there was one group, one group you'd think would have a problem here. One group would have a problem with voter ID. It's people who haven't registered to vote, right? These are the people who can't get the ID. They probably haven't registered because of the evil government who will not give them a driver's license, right? Wrong. If you're not registered to vote, you actually support it more. 83 to 15%. 
Those who have not registered to vote support voter ID more than those who have registered to vote. But this has always been, of course, an issue of race, seemingly like everything else in our society these days. And of course, Whitey is going to support voter ID because racism. White people do support voter ID, 77 to 21. But think about the last few months. All the talk about Jim Crow 2.0. Racism is why Republicans want to implement voter ID. They know blacks can't get ID, so they want to disenfranchise them. Yet, among non-whites, 84% of non-white voters support, support voter ID. Only 13% oppose it. There is actually more support, support for voter ID among non-whites than there are supporters among white people. By seven points, we are told a policy that is plus 71 among minorities is racist. Let me say that again. We are told that an issue that is plus 71 among minorities is racist. This is incomprehensible. This is not Jim Crow 2.0. There is an effort by the left to portray blacks as helpless and hopeless unless their white saviors from the Democratic Party step in to help them. But this is not true. Here's new member of Blaze TV, Jason Whitlock. You can subscribe and see his show at blazetv.com slash stew. It's going to be starting up really soon. Use the promo code stew. You'll save 10 bucks. But as Jason writes today for the Blaze, as a black man who is done with all of this nonsense, he writes, in their reimagining of our history, we have no accomplishments more compelling than our suffering. Our story isn't about what we've done or will do. It's about what has happened to us. We're an American tragedy. Think of this narrative. This is not who African Americans are. And no amount of effort from the media and the left to turn the story of black America into one of everlasting victimhood is going to make it so. Voter ID is just one example, but it's a powerful one. The leftist elites want to maintain control by treating everyone else like children. Well, we're not children, so shut up and respectfully, get out of our way. What a time to buy or sell a home. You are in the middle of the craziest time I think I can ever remember uh, doing it. Uh, house values are going through the roof right now. I mean, every time, you, do you, are you one of these people that goes on, your, uh, goes on like Zillow and checks your house value every day or two? You're like, gosh, how could it possibly worth that much? I mean, I live here and it's not this nice. It's true. It's happening all over the country right now. That's why you need a real estate agent who's going to come in and take charge. Someone who knows not only the market, but also the right way to play the market. You know, it's interesting when you're selling a house and you, you know, the house values are going up. You're thinking to yourself, well, we're going to make money. Well, you need to make the most money you can because you're probably going to have to go buy another house somewhere else and you need to make sure you have the best value. The same thing, when you're buying a house, you can't overpay too much here. This is a crazy market. Things get out of control fast. You have to have a real estate agent you can trust that knows how to act in this type of market. It's a, it's a unique one. Realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go to find that person. No matter where you are in the country, you can find the best agent in your area at realestateagentsitrust.com, realestateagentsitrust.com. Let's welcome in Nate Hotchman. He's a contributor to the American Mind and author of the new article, The Battle of Loudoun County. Be sure to check it out. We'll tweet out a link uh, shortly. Nate, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks, Stu. Good to be here. Uh, you know, this critical race theory thing is interesting in that, like, there's this presentation of it as, is, as if it's this new controversy, as if it's this new thing. Maybe the Republicans just created this thing to have a political issue to go into the 2022 midterms. But this is something that has been bubbling up in local communities uh, around the country for a long time in schools in particular. You talk about Loudoun County. Can you tell us how all of this came about? Right. Yeah. The, the culture war is always 
presented as the right instigating it, of course, right? This is something that Republicans are starting. But actually, this has been uh, an issue in our public schools for at least a couple of decades now. And parents are just starting to wake up to it and ask their legislatures to do something about it, which is why Republicans have finally gotten invested in the issue. But in Loudoun County, you know, the issue is particularly stark, and Loudoun County is sort of the tip of the spear for the fight over critical race theory in public school districts throughout the country, because the parents have actually really gotten organized. They've gotten together this grassroots effort, and they're actually committing to do something. They're running a recall election against the school board members who are pushing this stuff on their kids. They're suing the school board for pushing this stuff on their kids. They're really standing up, and they're saying, this is enough. No, no further. Stop teaching our kids to hate each other based on the color of their skin. And uh, they're having an enormously fantastic results as a result. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's really sort of an inspiration for folks around the country who are trying to push back on this stuff. <laughs> it really is incredible we have to have this conversation. We want to stop uh, you know, kids being taught to hate each other for the color of their skin in 2021. This is still going on. It really is incredible. Can you talk a little bit about Loudoun County, though? You describe it um, in an interesting way in that this is very typical of some suburban counties. A lot of people talked about, you know, during the election, all the stuff that may have gone on in cities, but like really the election uh, with Joe Biden turned on suburban counties in many of these states. And it was a, a seemingly a movement uh, for a lot of red counties that have been red for a long time, switching to blue counties over the past few years. Can you talk about that dynamic, particularly in Loudoun County? Yeah, so Loudoun County is a perfect example of what's happened in suburban America in the last few decades. You know, as late as 2004, it was solidly Republican, 55, 60 percent. Both 2000 and 2004, it went 55 percent for George Bush. By 2020, it went 25 points for Joe Biden. So it's just been an enormous swing towards the Democrats. Uh, and part of that is because of the people living there moving left, but a lot of it has to do with tons of people moving in, lots of immigrants who vote for Democrats, lots of progressive whites from uh, coastal cities moving in. It's totally transformed the county. And the result, of course, is that you get elect local Democrats who are pushing this stuff on the school board, uh, who are pushing critical race theory, who are you know woke left-wingers who think that this is an appropriate thing to teach to kids. But you know, one of the interesting things is not all Democrats are woke, right? So when mm. you talk to the people on the ground, the parents on the ground in Loudoun County, they're not all hardcore Republicans. A lot of them are, to be sure. But a lot of these people are moderate Democrats who might have voted for Joe Biden, but, you know, are standing up and saying, this isn't what we voted for, right? We might not have liked Trump. We might not like the Republicans, but we cannot stand this stuff being taught to our kids. This is way too far. So Democrats, both in Loudoun County and throughout the country, are getting way out over their skis and are pushing stuff that a lot of their voters were not asking for in the first place. Yeah, I think part of the, part of the problem here is this is what they're voting for. Whether they want to be voting for it or not, it is what they're gotcha. voting for. Um, we had a situation here in Texas in a town nearby our studios where there was a big sort of flare up about critical race theory uh, being taught in school in, in Texas um, and in, in, a, in a relatively red area. Um, after that started, uh, Demi Lovato, the pop star who used to grew up in the general area as well, was tweeting videos of these parents who would go to these meetings and say, look, we don't want our kids being taught critical race theory. And it was presented, of course, in a way that made them in a very unflattering uh, way. And I think there's this level of intimidation that people feel. They want to stand up. They want to stop this at their schools, but they're terrified of it. And they've seen examples of people like them having their lives destroyed for doing it. I mean, it's got to be very difficult for parents to stand up. Well, and this, what make, this is what makes the, the parents standing up both in the Texas district and Loudoun County and districts across the country so incredibly courageous. I mean, really, the Republican Party up until very recently has just been completely ignoring this stuff. They've been completely ignoring the education system in general. Uh, they've been playing down cultural issues. They haven't really wanted to fight these fights precisely because these are the scary fights that you know get them in trouble. But it is the grassroots, the parents who are leading this fight. And Republicans are just catching up at the state and federal level. But you know, this is a perfect example of the American spirit in action. Working in middle class parents standing up, you know, saying, okay, you know what? Our politicians aren't going to do anything about this, so we're, we have to do something about this. We have to take this into our own hands, and we don't care if the media is going to come crashing down on our heads, if uh, school boards are going to threaten us or you know, going to try to impose disciplinary action on our kids. All of that stuff is worth it. We're going to fight for this because we care, and it's working. I mean, they're winning. They're winning in Loudoun County. They're winning in Texas. They're winning all over the country. And the tide is really turning. And I think this is an example of conservatives actually winning on a cultural issue for the first time 
in decades. Uh, it's 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 fascinating and it's really encouraging for us. It does feel like a lot of these issues are um, just inherently obvious to people. Like they hear you hear someone saying, you know, what, we should discriminate against people. It's the only way to solve past discrimination is present dis uh, discrimination, as E. Brown Kendi uh, often says. And it's like people hear that and they know. Wait a minute, you're pro discrimination. You got a segregation area for certain races. Like inherently, we realize this stuff is obvious. Um, but it takes an effort to get parents and, and, and everyday people who are trying to live their lives and go to work and do their thing to really get uh, to, to wake up, uh, essentially, uh, to these things. Is that, the, is that the biggest effort here? Is this what needs to, to happen where we just need to have you know, the everyday person aware that this stuff is going on and then it can be stopped? Yeah, and this is also why, you know, the woke people, the people who are pushing critical race theory, uh, who are talking about equity instead of equality, are completely out of stuck, touch, out of step with the uh, with the average American voter, even the average Democratic voter, as, as we've seen in places like Loudoun County. Like you said, Stu, the average American still thinks discrimination is wrong. You know, they still believe actually that uh, uh, people should be judged by the content of their character rather than by the color of their skin, and that you shouldn't discriminate against people for their immutable characteristics. So when you know, people pushing critical race theory, and this goes all the way up to the top now, right? I mean, you have the Biden administration all in on this as well. Uh, you know, when they're embracing this stuff, they're totally alienating the average American. The average American is much more culturally conservative on these things um, than than the the left wing of the Democratic Party and increasingly the, increasingly the entire Democratic Party is. Uh, and Republicans need to realize that and they need to hammer this stuff. They need to make this a priority. This is how you win. You show the parents of children, you show the average person that this is what the Democratic Party stands for. This is what the left is trying to do to the country. And you know, unless you actually stand up and fight back, this is what's going to happen. This is a winning issue for Republicans. They need to prioritize it and they need to realize that this is what people care about. And it does seem like there's a few of those and there's a there's one, I don't know, maybe strategic political advantage that Republicans seem to have and that Democrats, even when pushed to the ex most extreme position, will not denounce these groups. They will not say critical race theory is bad. They will not say defund the police is bad in any forceful way. They will not say that, you know, abortion up to nine months is, is bad. They, 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 are, they will always give, you know, sort of these, I don't know, at, at the very best, a warbly sort of answer on these things. And it, it, when you put them and you make them face up to these extreme positions, so often it's, a, it's an easy way, I think, to paint to people that these, these people are not in touch with you. The Democrats, m many of them running for Congress, for Senate, and for the presidency, even people like Joe Biden, who seem generally moderate, will not j normally denounce the craziest positions of their side. And it's important to highlight that. Well, and are, they're often now actively pushing these things, right? I mean, the Democratic Party is scared of their left flank, and the left flank effectively controls the Democratic Party now. I, I'm tired of talking about moderates in the Democratic Party because, with the exception of maybe you know Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, there are no moderates left yeah. in the Democratic Party because even if they're not loudly pushing this stuff, they're never going to stand up and say no to it. We've seen it time and time again. The progressives control the agenda in the Democratic Party, both at the state and the federal level, uh, and the way again. Again, Republicans can win is to throw that back in their face and to, you know, when Joe Biden says he's a moderate, go, no, you're not. Look at what you're supporting, right? You're supporting nominees for the federal government who push critical race theory. You're prioritizing small business relief based on the racial identity of small business owners, right? You're talking about doing the same thing with vaccines. This is not moderation. This is never what moderation has looked like. So stop lying to Americans and saying you're moderate because this is what you stand for. Yeah, and to your point, I mean, look at the debate about the, the, uh, the filibuster. They keep going to cinema and mansion because they're the only ones who seem to have right. any problem with it at all. I mean, there's not there's not 25 Democrats who would stand up and say we shouldn't get rid of the filibuster. This is a crazy time. Right. And and those Democrats are incredibly courageous to their credit. I mean, if you you should see, you know, anyone who's paying attention has seen what they've tried to do to Manchin. I mean, there are protesters showing up outside of his office. They the, the left is really, really good at bullying people. They've mastered this art, you know, for decades and it's worked, right? They basically have captured the entire Democratic Party and the last few holdouts are getting battered right now.
um, as a result. And they probably won't be there for that much longer, frankly. So the left is really good at this. The right finally has started to figure out how to do this with showing up to school board meetings, you know, grassroots activism, showing up to protests to fight CRT, and we're actually winning for the first time ever. So learning how to use these tactics and actually learning how to fight on these terms is the way that we push back on this stuff. No, you have to do that, and it's really important, and it's happening in Loudoun County. You can read the article. I want to tweet it out here from at Stu Does America. Where can people get you on uh, Twitter, Nate? Uh, at NJ Hockman, N-J-H-O-C-H-M-A-N. Okay, and it's Battle of Loudoun County from the American Mind, Nate Hodgman. Nate, thanks so much for coming on the pro program, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Stu. I appreciate it. So you got free email, right? That's pretty cool. You don't have to pay anything for your email. Well, maybe you're paying a little bit. Maybe you're paying with your privacy. Maybe you're paying with your data to Gmail and Yahoo and all these companies. Uh, those companies have access to every email you send and receive. Uh, big tech can sell your data to the highest bidder, and they do it often. That's why you got to use StartMail to secure your email. StartMail keeps uh, your email p uh, private, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Why? Because this is what they prioritize. Email, uh, every email they, you send from your StartMail account is encrypted, even if the recipient doesn't use encryption. With StartMail, deleted means deleted. When you delete an email, it's gone forever. What a magical idea. StartMail uses their own servers, not Amazon's. They can't be put out of business like Parler or some of these other companies. StartMail is backed by the most stringent privacy laws in the world. So start securing your email privacy with StartMail. Uh, sign up now. You can get 50% off your first year. StartMail.com slash stew. That's StartMail, S-T-A-R-T, mail.com slash stew for 50% off your first year. StartMail.com slash stew. Don't miss out. Don't give big data all your don't give big uh, tech all your data. There's no reason for it. Startmail.com slash stew. Everything is racist. Every thought you have is a KKK dream. Everything is racist. Points of friends is the extreme. I'm entirely sure I'm gonna be able to get through this break. I'm just gonna be honest with you. We are just at one, uh, the, we are in such a dumb time. The, just dumb things, they get dumber all the time. So let's start here. Billie Eilish is in trouble because apparently she's a racist. Now, everything is racist, so of course Billie Eilish is a racist. We know it to be true. Uh, I have to play you this video, which is why she's in trouble, and then I'll tell you about it. But I will warn you, if you feel dumb now, this video is going to make you feel a lot dumber. You're going to watch it, and your, your IQ is going to drop by like 70% just watching this video. It's like 15 seconds long, but it's going to make you dumber. If you don't want to be dumber, you may want to skip ahead like 15 seconds. Here it is. What the f***? I love my dad, and he's Phineas, 61. Phineas comes in, and all I hear is which is like the theme song at the beginning of all David Dobrik videos. This is funny. So there you go. I probably have to speak slower to you now as your IQ is in the toilet. So that's Billie Eilish at like 13 years old doing something bad. What was the bad thing that she did? Well, apparently... One of those things that was bleeped in the middle of that video was her using an anti-Asian slur, sort of. She didn't actually say the thing. She didn't actually sing the song where the word was included, but she mouthed the word from the song. So someone made a song that used a bad word Billie Eilish formed her lips in the same fashion you would form your lips to say that word, but she didn't actually say the word, and therefore she's a racist. Okay, I and mean, this is the world that has been designed by people like Billie Eilish, and so I suppose we should sit here and watch her wallow in it, but I mean, I can't. This is ridiculous. I mean, honestly, like, if someone's going to get in trouble for saying this word, 
Should it not be the person who recorded the song with the word in it? Why would Billie Eilish, a 13-year-old listening to the song and mouthing a word in the middle, why would she be the one who's a racist? Wouldn't the person who recorded the song and actually said the word be the racist? It seems to me that would be obvious. But apparently, no, she had to apologize. Here's some of her idiotic apology. I love you guys, and many of you have been asking me to address this. This is the ultimate influencer sort of trick. Like, a lot of you guys have been asking me to tell you about my Nancy Pelosi sucks pen. And that's, look, it's right here. It's a wonderful pen. It looks just like the, the pen that Nancy Pelosi used uh, during the impeachment, except instead of saying Nancy Pelosi in her signature, is this Nancy Pelosi sucks? A lot of you guys have been asking me about them, and they're available at nancypelosisuckspen.com. So I don't know. Maybe a lot of people have been asking her to address this. She says, I love you guys, and many of you have been asking me to address this. And this is not something that I want to address because I'm being labeled something that I am not. Oh, I'm, I feel so bad for people on the left who get labeled as something they are not. Don't you feel terrible for them? I know I feel terrible for Billie Eilish because of this. There's a video edit going around of me when I was 13 or 14 where I mouthed a word from a song that at the time I didn't know was a derogatory term. I don't know if I believe that used against members of the Asian community. I am appalled. I mean, is she still 13 or 14? I'm appalled and embarrassed and want to barf. <laughs> I mean, it goes on for like an hour here. I could read you the whole thing, but uh, I, I feel like I'd rather kill myself. So <laughs> I'm going to. So I guess Billy... <laughs> Billie Eilish is racist because she mouthed a word that's bad in a song, but the guy who wrote the song, who, by the way, is uh, Tyler, the creator. Now, Tyler, the creator, of course, happens to be African-American, which makes him incapable of racism. Now, certainly he used this terrible slur against Asians in one of his publicly released songs, but should he face any consequences? Of course not. We know that all anti-Asian violence is of course uh, formed at the feet of white supremacy, which is bizarre because I will tell you some of the worst white supremacists I've ever seen are black people who seem to be beating up Asian Americans on video. Now, look, they're not uh, any black person out there uh, who is sitting back and saying, hey, wait a minute. I didn't beat up any Asian Americans today. You probably didn't. Guess what? Neither did I. Some people do terrible things. And I don't know, maybe not blaming an entire race for those issues is the right way to go. However, in this particular case, we do have the exact name of the person who did the song and it said that word about Asian Americans. We know it. His name is Tyler. He's a creator. But he's not the one in trouble here. You should note that he is not a racist. It's the little white girl who at 13 years old mouthed one of the words, one of the many offensive words probably in that song, mouthed one of them, and years later, she is going to get canceled over it. Well, I hate to tell you, Billy, uh, you're definitely a racist. Why? Because everything is racist. Everything is racist. Every thought you have is a KKK dream. Everything is racist. White supremacist extreme. All right, we all know about protein bars. Do you know about protein bars? Everyone knows about protein bars. But protein bars, okay. They've got this chemical taste. They taste like junk. Maybe some sawdust thrown into the junk and then some cardboard on top. They're not good. Unless, of course, you're talking about built bars. Built bars are different. They've changed the whole dynamic. They've got nine flavors. Did you know that? They've got, uh, of course, some limited time flavors that they add on to that. But they always have coconut, coconut almond, cherry, raspberry, mint brownie, peanut butter brownie, double chocolate, salted caramel. My mouth waters every time I read this list. 
there's something for everybody. And if you uh, don't know what flavor you enjoy, you can get a mixed box. You can try two of each of the nine flavors. Built Bars aren't the just the best tasting protein bar. They're healthy. They've got 17 grams of protein, 130 calories, only four grams of sugar, four grams of net carbs. You're not going to beat that. So go to built.com. It used to be builtbar.com. I don't know. Now it's built.com. Why? Apparently, so many people love Built Bars, they're able to get Built.com that shows how cool they are. Built.com. Now, I will say, they've got a fantastic URL, but a really bad promo code. Their promo code is terrible. Why? The promo code is Stew15, and you're saving 10%. Why did they do that? I don't know. I mean, they're wonderful people. I love them to death. I don't understand why 10% off for Stew15. Maybe if you complain, they'll tell you, you know what? We'll give you 12.5% off, and we'll call it even. Stew15, 10% off, built.com. You're going to love the bars, and you're going to forgive them instantly for the promo code. Stew15, 10% off at built.com. Carl Nassib of the Las Vegas Raiders uh, has come out of the closet, as it were, and is announcing he is gay. Um, Now, look, you know how I feel about identity politics and stuff. I don't necessarily like it. You know, it's not really my thing. I don't think, you know, look, you want to put your, put you put your thing wherever you want to put your thing, right? Everyone can put their thing, assuming the other person is interested in it at that time. That's, that's an important disclaimer here. But like, basically, you need to kind of do what you want as long as uh, people uh, who you're with enjoy it, okay? There was a, a fi- fantastic documentary many years ago about a man who loved an apple pie. It was called American Pie, I think. Is that called American Pie? Does that sound right? Is that the name of that stupid movie? Anyway. Okay, thank you. Yes, American Pie. So he and he loved the pie, and you know what? Good for him. Whatever. Like I, I, I don't, I don't see why it's any of my business, frankly. Uh, and you know, uh, that's I think goes across across all boundaries here. You kind of do what you do. Um, some people have been critical of Carl Nassib's announcement. I think it was actually a really good one. Uh, let, let me play it for you here and uh, and, and break it down a little bit uh, here. Uh, this is uh, Carl Nassib of the of the Raiders. What's up, people? I'm Carl Nassib. I'm at my house here in Westchester, Pennsylvania. just want to take a quick moment to say that I'm gay. I've been meaning to do this for a while now, but I finally feel comfortable enough to get it off my chest. Um, I really have the best life. I got the best family, friends, and job a guy could ask for. Um, I'm a pretty private person, so I hope you guys know that I'm really not doing this for attention. Um, I just think that representation and visibility are so important. Um, I actually hope that like one day Videos like this and the whole coming out process are just not necessary. Um, but until then, you know, I'm going to do my best and do my part to cultivate a culture that's accepting, that's compassionate. And I'm going to start by donating $100,000 to the Trevor Project. They're an incredible organization. They're the number one suicide prevention service for LGBTQ youth in America. And they're truly doing incredible things. And I'm very excited to be a part of it, to help in any way that I can. And I'm really pumped to see what the future holds. Uh, that's all I have for you guys. I hope you have a great day. Work hard. All right. So there you go. Uh, he, he's gay. And he says uh, uh, he's going to donate $100,000 to the Trevor uh, Project, which by everything I've heard is a really good organization that helps kids and uh, younger people in, in, in tough situations. Great. Uh, one of the things, though, I think he needs to be worried about here is that you have to understand in today's culture that when you do these things, yeah, it might feel good at first, right? You might say, you know, he said he's getting 100% support, which is fantastic, and that's how it should be, right? However, he has to realize he's going to get canceled for this video. This video is going to end. We have this, you know, you have your pre-diabetes. This is like pre-cancellation. Why? Right now he's not getting canceled, but eventually he will, because he said he thought he didn't, uh, eventually we should get to a point where these videos don't even matter. We don't even think about whether you're gay or straight. Who cares? You just do what you do. Well, that's, like my position and I'm totally canceled. That's like MLK's position on race, right? We shouldn't think about, we should be colorblind. We shouldn't care about race. That's the exact opposite of what you're supposed to do now. All you're supposed to do is think about what characteristic you have that puts you in some, as some member of a group. So maybe, I hope for Carl's sake, he does not get canceled from this, but I think eventually it's going to come back and bite him. You're not allowed to downplay these things anymore. They have to be our ultimate focus all the time. We can't just like people because they're cool people. We can't just say, hey, you seem pretty cool. I like you. You're, I, like, I like hanging out with you. Now it has to be all about groups and things that, that, that all these dividing lines that we're supposed to emphasize all the time. 
He said he doesn't want those lines to be emphasized. Cancel him immediately. Also, we have uh, the Television Academy. This is uh, working on, uh, what is this? Is this uh, the Emmys, the Oscars, the, the Tonys, the one of those dumb awards? And they had an issue here because one of the uh, people in Billions, the show, Asia Kate Dillon, was a gender, bi- uh, or I guess probably is, a gender bi- uh, non-binary performer and played a non-binary character on the TV show. And they didn't know what category, is it best actress or best actor? And they were very upset about this arrangement because they didn't want to pick one of these categories. Well, they've come up now with a solution to this. Instead of getting a best actor or actress award, you'll get a performer award. Well, you'll get a best actor. You still have to pick one of the categories. So like if you uh, were born, let's say, uh, uh, as a girl and you now consider yourself uh, gender non-binary, you can still go as a best actor or best actress, but you have to pick one. And then when you win, they won't tell you you've won Best Actress. They'll tell you you've won the Performer Award. So there you go. I mean, we're solving problems like crazy today. And another problem solved. We were worried about it. Should a weightlifter who was at least at one point, we believe, a man, who is now a transgendered athlete, should that person be able to compete in the Women's Olympics? The answer to that now, of course, is... Yes. Now, somehow, somehow this, I mean, look, these things, I understand that this can be uncomfortable, but let me just say this. There's just no 43-year-old women who can compete in the Olympics, right? I'm 45, okay? I can't compete. I can't even, I barely can walk from one side of my backyard to the other, okay? I mean, like this is, you you get this old and and nothing works. So the idea that this this a guy is not going to compete in the guys' Olympics necessarily at 43 years old, certainly not going to be able to compete. A woman's not going to be able to compete against other women in the Olympics at 43 years old. So now we have a guy who is transgendered is now a, ma- a woman is now able to compete in the women's Olympics. And there's like, you know, a woman who was going to go to the Olympics and now can't go to the Olympics because because Laurel Hubbard. Do we have a picture? This very, this 43-year-old who used to be a man and now we all believe is a woman. (laughs) It's a nice picture, I will say. It's a very attractive picture. A 43-year-old is now going to the Olympics and a woman who trained her whole life and did everything she could to make it there deserved to go and instead, that guy's going. Back in a second. And a man in Nebraska spent his Wednesday trying to set a world record for what exactly? Naked skydiving. Ryan Kunoff says he did it Mm. not for the novelty of being in the air nude, but for those who never got to celebrate a 100th jump. He says he had a friend who was close to his 100th skydive before sadly passing. Mm. He says he is surprised by the amount of support he has received. That's humbling how much my friends and the people I care about are there they're not here just to support me they're here to support what we're doing and the strength that we all have in this community is something that i think the world needs he surpassed his goal of 60 jumps finishing with that total by sunset i'm sure a very freeing experience i i'm sure it was i will say it's the heartwarming moment of him almost coming to tears talking about his friend who passed away was dampered a little bit by the idea that his junk was hanging out probably while he was doing it. You know, it's just the the male body just not designed for those types of moments. Just kind of things flapping in the wind when you're trying to to come up with some real emotion. And I don't know that that it works. If you happen to look up in the sky and see someone's wind swirled genitalia approaching you at 150 miles an hour, don't be disturbed. Um, It's just the Guinness Book of World Records attempt. And anyone would like to attempt 61 naked sky- skydives in the 24 hours, I will throw in a, a Nancy Pelosi sucks pen. I don't know where you're going to put it. I'm worried about where you'll hold it. But uh, by the way, a new shirt is up. Wokeness is weakness. Wokeness is weakness. Go to stewdoesmerch.com. Pick one up today. Wokeness is weakness.